Amen. So I was quite excited about this talk today, even though, if I'm honest, it's not one of those that's titled that goes, wow, this is going to be amazing. But it, it's titled, Draw Near to God. Simple as that, Draw Near to God. But the reason why I'm so excited about it is because two weeks ago I was in prayer evening and all of a sudden I found myself keep saying, draw near to God, draw near to God, draw near to God. I knew there was more to it than that. And I remembered the verse, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. But I knew there was more to it. I just felt God was saying, Aaron, draw near to me, draw near to me, draw near to me. And from that moment, I keep spending extra time going to the church, just being alone. Yesterday, I had a few hours alone, just me, up in the church, New Year's Eve. I thought, I'm not going to see the New Year's Eve in without spending time with God, just because we never had a New Year's Eve service. I thought, it doesn't matter. I'm going to spend my time with God. I'm going to draw near to Him, and I'm going to trust that He's going to draw near to me. For us to complete the things that God has called us to do, we need to draw near to Him. And so when I felt God give this message, it was one of those messages that I'm like, Okay, because I've heard God's voice on it. I know it's going to be for people. I know it's important. I know it's worth it. And so I'm really excited about it because it's not just something that I've said, oh, well, let's teach on this because the church needs to know. Or It's something that I feel like God has said, Aaron. It's like a rhema word. Draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. And so in my heart, I wanted everybody in the church to come to New Year's Eve. I mean, New Year's Day service. But in God's heart, he, he... Chose those that he needs in the room. And so I believe you're in the room for a reason. And those that aren't in the room, hopefully they catch up online later. But draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Let's just put James 4. Did I give you James 4, right? Yeah, let's put James 4, right? So I've told you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. I could stop it there and say that's the bit that we're on about. But to keep it in context... Cleanse your hearts, you sinners, and purify your hearts. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Thanks for that, Aaron. But grab hold of the draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. What is drawing near? And this is a very simple picture that God gave me, because God does simple things with me, because I'm simple, and I have this knack of sharing the word in a very simple way. So God showed me a picture of a restaurant, and I'm in a restaurant, and Helen's trying to talk to me. But it's really loud in there. So what do I do when she's going on and on and on? Just get up and go out. No, I don't. She's going on. I draw near to her so I can hear her. I draw near to her so I can hear her. Helen's over the other side of the restaurant. And she's like, hey, man. And I'm like, who's that? Who's that? Hey, man. Who, who's that? So what do I do? I draw near to her so I can see her. You see, there's, there's some, something about drawing near and it's about hearing and seeing. And as, as I draw near to God, I want to hear him better. I'm going to see him better. But there's a verse that I haven't put it up there, but it's, it's verse four and it says, friendship with the world is hatred towards God. So it speaks about friendship with the world is hatred towards God. And then it goes on about draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So very simple picture I had was I'm here. God's there. If I draw near to God from this position, from this stance, nothing can get in between. If I draw near to God from this position, from this stance, from this heart, I can see him, I can hear him. I can see him, I can hear him. But if I'm over here, friendship with the world is hatred towards God. If I've left room, if I've left room, the world can get in. The world can get in. But if I draw near to God... I push out any way the world can get in. The world can't get in. You can't get in here. There's no space. There's no space. When I stand in this position, when I'm in this position, when I've drawn near to God and God draws near to me, I can see him. I can hear him. It's so much better. From this position, there's no room for anything else to come in. There's no room for anything else to penetrate. It's just me and God. We're going all the way. The psalmist Psalm 20, 24, verse 3 to 4. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Him with clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands 
and a pure heart. Who's not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor swore deceitfully. You see, they, they go together because James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Who wants to go to the top of the mountain? Who wants to stand in his holy place? Those that have clean hands and a pure heart. There's something about you draw near to God. God draws near to you. You just close that gap. Nothing's getting in between. And what happens from this position? I can see him. I can hear him. When I'm over here and the distractions of the world, it's like being in the restaurant and God shouting, Aaron, Aaron, like Helen. It's like, who's that? Who's that? I'd have to draw near to see. Yep, 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 yep. God wants to talk. Again, like Helen. Can't hear, can't hear. What am I going to do? I'm going to draw near. I'm going to draw near. Well, if I've already drawn near, draw near to God and he draws near to you. When he talks, okay, Lord. Who's that? It's God. I can see, I can hear. Because I'm living my life by the side of him. I'm living together with him. But what happens is, after we've heard a message like this, we do it for a week and then we just filter back into our normal lifestyle and a few months down the road, God's such a distance. He's the other side of the restaurant again. You can't hear him because of all the noise going on in your life, all the things that have taken place. You've had promotion at work and there's a new grandchild or you're having a baby or you've got a new partner. All these things have come in and you just move God out the way or you draw away from God and you draw away from God and the gap gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But it was never intended like that because how lost another one, as the song said that we sang, how lost another one? How lost another one? Because Christ got up onto a cross and brought you with him. Yeah. Brought you with him. Christ didn't get up on the cross and hold you at a distance and say, over there, my son, you, you know, you're an addict or oh, you make too many mistakes or you've done too much wrong. No, Christ said for the addict, for the prostitute, for the businessman, for the teacher, I'm taking it all for you. It doesn't matter where you're from, who you are, what colour you are, what your name is, what you've done. I went to the cross for each and every one of you. Draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. The Old Testament, the Old Testament, we see that there was a high priest and only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies once a year. But when Jesus died on the cross, he tore that veil. He tore that veil and said, church, welcome in. Come in. You can now all come in and sup with me. You can now all come in. You don't need the man at the front to do it for you. You don't need to go into a confessional box and, and give your sins to a priest and the priest will give them up to heaven. No. He says, come directly to me. Me and you are in communion. Me and you are in relationship. I've got a bit of advice for you though. Draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. Draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. I'm going to use Mary and Martha as a great example in a moment. But first of all, how do you draw near to him? Well, it starts with honesty regarding sin and a need for cleansing. Purify your heart, clean your hands. It starts with an honesty of like the sin in my life. I'm doing things wrong. I need to be honest about that. And now I need to accept and acknowledge that I need my sin cleansed. Whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, this can speak to both of you right now. For the believer, it's like, I want to know more of Jesus. I want to walk with him more. I've got some things wrong in my life, Lord. I know you don't like them. I want them out of my life. I'm going to draw near to you. The more of you in me will just push out the things of the world. And for the one that doesn't believe in Christ in the room or doesn't follow Jesus, Jesus would say to you, come to me, acknowledge your sin and I will come. And remove it from you. In Christian jargon, my blood will cleanse you. What does that mean, Aaron? It means that he went to a cross and he paid the price for you. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. But it's deeper than even that. Drawing near to God is deeper than that. It's as I was praying this last couple of weeks to God about this draw near, draw near, draw near. I felt as I, I was praying, God was saying, the drawing near is like, I'm in all your decisions now. 
The drawing near is, I'm in your workplace now. The drawing near is, I'm in your family now. The drawing near is, I'm in every part of you. If you want to draw near to me, to genuinely draw near to me, to go closer and closer, it means I'm your life, I'm your future, I'm your decisions, I'm everything. That's what it is to separate. That's what it is to, to remove the world from your life. That's what it is to remove everything else and to say Christ is it. He's my everything. He's my all. That's what it is. It's to say Christ, you're my life now. You're my decisions now. You're my future now. You're everything. What I do, I do with you. I'm an ambassador for Christ. Hence, when I jokingly said about going out New Year's Eve, the fact is, we're ambassadors for Christ. And so, he's our everything. So you can go out and celebrate New Year's Eve. Of course you can. But if at 12 o'clock you're on the tables with your top off, swinging it around your head, and another beer down, and you're absolutely off your trolley, is that the example that Christ has... Did Christ come to die for that? Did Christ, technically, yes, he did come to die for that. But he didn't come for his, what you call it, his people to live like that. He didn't come for that. He said, cleanse your hearts or cleanse your hands and purify your hearts. Remove that stuff. Remove that stuff out of your life. Drawing near to God is a deepening. Drawing near to God is more about a heart attitude. The highest place of heaven is the feet of Jesus. It's the highest place of heaven, is at the feet of Jesus. Hence, I've got to talk about Mary and Martha. Everything you need is at his feet, church. Everything you need is at his feet. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, 2023, just make the rest of our life a drawing near. Like, I want to go to his feet. Jesus knocks at the door of the Laodicean church. We see that in Revelation. It says because they're lukewarm. He's knocking at the door because they haven't got his full attention. He's knocking at the door because they've allowed things in between. If they would draw near to God and God would draw near to them, he wouldn't have had to stand at the door and knock. He'd already have been in there. But because he doesn't have their full attention, he's knocking at the door. And is he knocking at your door tonight? Or today? Is he knocking at your door? Is he knocking at the door and saying, have I got your full attention? I want to draw near to you, but I need you to draw near to me. I want to come closer to you, but I need you to choose me. I will not push myself upon you. I need you to choose me. I want your full attention. In Luke chapter 7, we see Simon's house and the Pharisees. They question Jesus because a lady's come and she's touched him. He's a, she's a sinner. And the Pharisees are questioning and saying, if this Jesus was really a prophet, he wouldn't allow this woman to touch him. He would know who she is. Then he turned to the woman and he said to Simon, do you see this woman? Simon, you know, is one of the disciples. He's a good man, is he? Going to be a good man? I entered your house, Simon. You gave me no water for my feet. But she's washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss. But this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil. But this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. This lady fell at the feet of Jesus. She fell at the feet of Jesus. It's a position that Jesus likes, not because he's got some power trip, but at the feet of Jesus. It's the highest place of heaven. It's the highest place in heaven is at the feet of Jesus. The Pharisees didn't understand Simon had the opportunity. You see, sometimes we let Jesus into our house. We let him in our house, just like Simon. Simon said, come into my house. But somebody like a Mary, when Jesus is in the house, she won't miss the opportunity. She will go straight to his feet. She will go straight to his feet. I said, dry eyes make a dry heart. Dry eyes, dry heart. 
I think some of us need to weep a bit more for the lost. I think some of us need to weep a bit more for Christ. Dry eyes, dry heart. We let Jesus in our house, but it's more than that. It's deeper than that. To his feet we must go. Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha, sisters of Lazarus. Luke 10, 38 to 42. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Well done, Martha. Welcome Jesus in. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. Have you noticed that Martha notices Mary and Martha says, Look what Mary, Mary's just sitting there. She's not doing, I'm doing all the work and Mary's not doing anything. But Mary never once notices Martha. Because when you're at the feet of Jesus, you don't notice the things around you. It's like people in church when, when you're worshipping God and you're like, I'm just loving on God. But then you've got those people that notice everything. Well, that person was doing that and that person was there and that person was on their phone and that person got... Like, stop looking at other people. Keep your eyes on Jesus, you won't see nobody else. Keep your eyes on Jesus, you won't see Martha hurrying about and working. And by the way, let me tell you, we need Marthas. Amen. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with Martha. This isn't Mary versus Martha. This is Mary before Martha. You go sit at the feet of Jesus and Jesus will make you a Martha. Go be a Mary first and then he will make you a Martha. You've got to sit at the feet of Jesus before you can go do the things for this world. You've got to sit at the feet of Jesus before you can go tell the world. You've got to know the one you're telling the world about. There's nothing wrong with Martha. Don't get mistaken. We need Marthas in the church. Without a Martha in the church, everything will be left to the pastor. Everything. Without your Marthas. Ray reminds me of a Martha. Martha's not a bad thing. Martha's a good place. But you cannot be a Martha. You cannot be a Martha and be successful or, or, or whatever I'm trying to say without first being a Mary. It's not Mary versus Martha. It's Mary before Martha. The Pharisees asked Jesus, what is the greatest command? And I hadn't seen this until this week. And I thought, of course, it just fits into my talk now. Matthew 22, 37. Obviously, I know the greatest command that was given in the second one, but I've never looked at it like this. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. Come sit at my feet. Come sit at my feet. That's the greatest commandment of all. Love the Lord your God with everything that you've got. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. Go be a Martha. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. Amen. It, for me, it's so simple. Like, it's just like, how simple is that, God? Like, love you with everything that we've got and then go love the world. Be a Mary, then be a Martha. It isn't rocket science, is it? Like seriously, that is the, one of those moments. You know when I talk about a mic drop and stuff like, if I could have wrapped that, I, I would have <laughs> dropped the mic and just walked out of this place and just go, I've done, Lord. I, I've completed the mission. I'm ready to come home. I've done it. Like, be a Mary and then be a Martha. Like, even his, his, the greatest commandment is love God with everything you've got and then go. And then go, love God, sit at his feet, just worship him, draw near to God. When you're in that place, I've drawn near, God's drawn near to me. We're in that communion, we're in this together. Now I can go. Now I can go love the, my neighbour. Now I can go tell the world that Jesus lives because I sit at his feet. You sit at his feet first, then will come the work. 
You must go to his feet first. The first precedes the second. It's the order of God. Genesis 2 verse 8. I, I don't know why, but I just felt it was, it was needed to say Genesis 2 verse 8. The Lord planted a garden. The Lord planted a garden. Why did he plant a garden? He planted that garden and that's where he had communion with Adam. It was in that place. You see, God makes places of encounters. He creates places of encounters for us to encounter him. God wants to spend time with us. So he plants a garden for Adam to be in so that he can walk in the cool of the day with Adam. Because he wants relationship with you. He wants you to draw near to him so he can draw near to you. He, he knows what he's doing. It's in all his blueprints to have a place to be with you. And this is why we say this is a house of prayer and worship. And this is why we've got to get into the house of prayer and worship. It can't become secondary. It must be primary alongside those things of our faith. Why? Because we want to spend so much time with Jesus. Why wouldn't I want to get into his house? Why would I want to have New Year's Day off just because it's New Year's Day? And I know that will ruffle some feathers, especially if they're watching this and they've not been to church today. Well, we've been to church all year round. We've not had a week off. So, Amen. who cares if you haven't had a week off church? God never had a second off the cross for you. Who, who cares? Oh, well. And you, you know the funny thing is, some of you are clapping and it's the first time you've been to church for eight weeks. <laughs> Just because you're in here today doesn't mean you get a gold tick. You know, you don't live to me, you live to Christ. Amen. And Christ sees. Christ sees us having these times up in life. We're so half-hearted with him like. And, and please, I know somebody texted me today saying, oh, I'm at work and that. And I wouldn't want anyone to think, oh no, I need to explain to Aaron why I'm not at church. No, you don't. You never need to explain to me why you're not at church. You will never stand before Aaron. You will never stand before Aaron and have to give an account of your life. You stand before Jesus and give an account of your life to him. If you're having the week off church, like church isn't a religious thing. I don't go to church because I have to. I go to church because I want to. I go to church because I want to spend time with Jesus. But many of us, unfortunately, in the body of Christ today and in LBC, we're no super church. But people in LBC would have woke up this morning and said, I'm going to have today off. Why? Why? Why did people say, I'm going to have Christmas Day off? Christmas Day was a Sunday. I don't remember all your faces, Christmas Day in church. But Christmas Day was a Sunday. As why? Why do we just, I have a day off. Imagine if God had the day off from us. Imagine if God said, okay, church, Look after yourself for the day. See how you get on with the devil. Just imagine if God handed us over for a day to the devil. Now, I'm not, you know, trying to, I'm not trying to condemn anyone in the room. What I'm trying to do is challenge you to say, I want to draw near to God. I want to draw near to God. I want God to draw near to me. I don't want anything in between us. I'm going to make God my priority. Amen. That's all I'm trying to do. But if I'd said it in a nice little, try and make God your priority, you'd forget the word. But if I say, where are you today? And what are you clapping for? You weren't even here last week. You know, that, that offends you. And that makes you, oh, I don't like that pastor. Who does he think he is? But God can work with that. God can work with that. The Bible says you're neither hot nor cold. I'm about to spew you out of my mouth. Lukewarm he doesn't like. I don't want to make you lukewarm Christians. I want to make you hot for Jesus or, or offend you so much that you're like, I don't want to go to church. Jesus can work with that as well. It's when we're just in the middle and it's like, oh, the preacher rubbed my belly today, tapped my back. I'll make you a lukewarm Christian all the way to hell. And I need, I need to hear those words, how lost another one. How lost another one. Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. She did not miss the window of opportunity. We get so busy around Jesus, doing Jesus, we never actually just stop and look at Jesus. Like we all want to do for Jesus, but we never want to be with him. It's like the cost. If you want to, if you want to plant 21 churches, if you want to head up a 21 church plant with three or four in the background, you've got to know there's a cost to it. And many people in this room would say, Aaron, 
I want what you've got. I know many people would say, Aaron, I want what you've got. Not because I'm anything special, just because it's, like, it's, it's pretty successful as, as things go, looking in the flesh, in the world. Started with 25 people, and now there's 21 congregations in seven nations in six years. That's pretty good. I want that. But do you want the cost? A lot of people want the blessings. A lot of people want the anointing, but they do not want what it costs. It will cost you family. It will cost you time. It will cost you your life. It will cost you your decisions. It will cost you your wants. And then at the end of that, you've then got a congregation that you say something like, where was you? Why wasn't you at church? What are you clapping for? And it offends some people and I'll get messages today and it goes on and on and on. It never stops. But there's a cost. There's a cost. But the, the reward, I can see him, I can hear him. Like I'm just walking in the cool of the day. Like if I was a six-year-old, I'd hold his hand and I'd just like skip along. But because I'm not, I do a Matthew, what's his name? The Welsh, not the Welsh guy, the Liverpool guy, McIntyre. Michael McIntyre. Woo! You know? You know Michael McIntyre? No? Don't know him? Yeah. That's what he does anyway. That's what I do with Jesus. Just in the cool of the day. When you're in that place, I get to stand with him. I can hear him. I can see him. When I've let the world get in, when I've let other things get in, I can't hear him the same. I can't see him the same. And before you know it, things have pushed you out. But I think God is saying to us as a church and as individuals, come be a Mary. Take this season to be a Mary. If you've got a ministry and you need to put it down, put your ministry down. Come be a Mary. Like, I hope not everyone comes and puts their ministries down, otherwise <laughs> me and Helen are in trouble. We've got a lot of extra work to do. But the truth is, if that's what God says to you, go be a Mary. Go be a Mary. Like, don't, don't worry. And if God tells you to... Go take yourself into a forest for the next six weeks. Go take yourself into a forest for the next six weeks. You're excused from church. Go be a Mary. Go be a Mary. Get at his feet. Get at his feet. And then he'll bring you to be a Martha. Mary made Jesus a priority. We need Mary and Martha. It's not what you do for God, but who you are for God. That's what's important. It's not what you do for him, it's who you are for him. Jesus wants you at his feet. He wants you in a relationship where it's just you and him before you worry about anything else. Before you worry about anything else. And again, please hear me. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Going to church doesn't get you extra brownie points or nothing like that. That's never been my intention in what I said my intention is to challenge you to make Jesus your priority. Make Jesus your priority. And I've, I always try and make you want to see Jesus as your priority. And I've done it in many different ways. And today, that's just the way that we used. Make Jesus your priority. Make him your priority. Be a Mary, primary calling. Be a Mary and God will make you a Martha to do the things that will change the communities, change the world, change your families. Mary refused to not miss this moment. Jesus is in my house. Jesus was in the house of Simon. And he didn't wash his feet. He didn't kiss him. He did nothing. But when Mary walked into that house, she went straight to his feet and cried. and With her hair and her tears, the Bible says. Well, this time... Jesus goes to Mary and Martha's house. And Mary said, I'm not missing this moment. I'm not missing this moment. I'm drawing near to God. I will not miss this moment. Nothing will take this moment from me. Nothing at all. I'm not missing it. I'm not missing it. Jesus, I'm at your feet. And Martha probably thought she was doing right because she was doing all the practical things. And Jesus is saying, you've missed the point. Come be at my feet. Then we can get on with those things. Come be at my feet first. <coughs> John 11, verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus. This is the brother of Mary and Martha. Martha. Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. I'm going to read these verses to you 
John 11, 20 to 27. There's a little bit of reading, but we are coming to the end now. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, Martha, remember, Martha's the one that does all the busy stuff. Mary's the one that lays at the feet of Jesus. Martha, busybody Martha. As soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary was, there's Mary sitting in the house again. I'm starting to think Mary actually just is lazy. <laughs> Forget everything that I've said. Mary's just lazy. Ignore the talk. So Mary's sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Remember that in verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Let's see Jesus' response. Jesus' response to Martha was, but even now I know that, no, she's still saying, but even now that I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus' response, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of the God who is to come into the world. Now we're going to see in a moment, we're going to see in a moment. Martha goes and gets Mary. So Martha now runs and gets Mary. She's run, she's got Mary and she said, Mary, the, the teacher's here and he's calling for you. And now Mary goes in verse 32. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she did what? She fell down at his feet saying to him, remember verse 21, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. What was Jesus' response this time? Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. What's the difference between Mary and Martha? The difference was this. Mary was here at the feet of Jesus, saying, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. She's crying at his feet. And now those crying, that position, that stance of her moved the the God of this world to groan and cry in his spirit. But yet Martha said the same words, but Martha turned up. If you would have been here, my, my brother wouldn't have died. But he didn't move God in the same way. But this time when Mary turns up, it moves God. It's the stance and the position of her heart. It's the stance of where she's come from. It's as a drawing close. It's like me and you were in communion. We're together. Like, what moves God's heart? The stance of us. And it's not about a position. It's not about if you're at his feet. It's about those that say, God, you're my life. You're my decisions. You're my future. You're my everything. I forget everything. When you turn up into my house, everything's put aside. Everything's put aside. I'm with you. In verse 34. And he said, where have you laid him? You see, it's moved God straight into action. With Martha, God's having a conversation. You know that he arrives. You know this. You know that. You know this. You know. He's just responding question after question. But with Mary, she's moved him to a place now that he's gone straight into action. Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And once again, the longest verse in the Bible, verse 35, Jesus wept. It's the shortest verse. But it's the longest in one sense as well. See, so yeah, upside down, like, love your enemy. Like Jesus wept, like the, the Son of God was moved to tears. There's power in those two words. There's power beyond power in those two words. And it's because Mary came from a different stance. The only difference between Mary and Martha was the stance, was the position. And so our being with God, desiring him, choosing him above anything, is what moves God's heart. Verse 38 and 39. 
Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. He's still groaning. After a conversation with Mary, like God is being moved. And now let's have a look at Martha. Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the one who had a conversation with Jesus and said, I believe that you're rising from the dead. I believe all these things. Yes, I know you can do it. I know you're God. I know you're this. She shows a great amount of faith here, doesn't she? Uh, don't take away the stone. Uh, Lord, by this time there is a stench. For he's been dead now four days. Don't do that, Lord. Martha, I thought you believed. Martha, you need to go be a Mary first. You need to go get at my feet because when you go to my feet, when you make that your position, then you know that I can do anything. You know that I can do all things. I stand here today because I'm a Mary. I'm not a Martha, I'm a Mary. There are times when I walk in the gift of a Martha and I have to do things, of course. But my primary focus is to be a Mary. I sit at the feet of Jesus. From there, I can hear him better, you see. When I'm this close to him, Aaron, go plant a church in Rochdale. Okay. I can go. I know it's going to happen. It doesn't matter what troubles and tough times come along the way. I know it's going to happen because he said, go do it. Because I'm here. But if I'm over here, I might not hear right. Like, did, did you say... Rochdale or Rotherham? What? But when I'm in close union with God, when I'm walking side by side with him, I can hear him. I can feel his heart. When I'm at this position, in this stance, this stance is a lot different than this stance. This stance of Jesus, you're my everything. You're everything that I want, everything that I need. I desire you more than anything, Lord. It's New Year's Eve, but I'm giving hours to you today because you're worthy of it. I don't want to go into 2023 without having time with you. I want to dedicate 2023 to you from that stance. It's better than... Okay, I want to get a promotion this year. I want to do this this year. I want to... I want to really bless um, my family this year. Nothing wrong with blessing your family. Nothing wrong at all blessing the family. Just hear the difference. It's me, 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 me. And then we throw in others because we're nice people and we want to help people. But charity and works doesn't save anyone. It's the grace of God that saves. But how do you know the grace of God? By being at the feet of Jesus. By being a Mary. Go know Jesus like that. Go know Jesus. In Mark 40, Matthew 26 and Luke 7. Mary from Bethany, the alabaster flask of costly oil. Mark 14, verse 9. And we'll finish on this. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. This was Mary that smashed an alabaster jar to prepare Jesus, if you like, for his burial. And I think it was Judah that said, we could have sold that. Yeah, of course. Wherever the gospels preach, this will be mentioned. So when this question's asked, and I, I read this question down, what does a life impacted by the gospel look like? I think Jesus' answer is tell Mary's story. That is what a life impacted by the gospel looks like. Someone that says, I want to sit at the feet of Jesus. I choose Jesus. I choose Jesus. For the Christian in the room today, I hope you've took the challenge. I hope you've took the challenge. I hope you don't walk away feeling got at in any way, shape or form. You who are online that didn't turn up today, I hope you do. That obviously is a joke. I hope you don't feel got at. I hope you feel the challenge. And you say, I want to be a Mary. I've been trying to be a Martha. I've been trying to do all these things. I've got to be a Mary. From Mary, it takes you to do the things that Martha did. You'll change worlds. You'll change families. You'll change your communities. You'll do the things that God's taught you, asking you to do. But first, sit at his feet. Draw close to him and he'll draw near to you. There's no room in between. You're like, 
I think there's a saying, thick as thieves. I don't know if that's the right saying to say between you and Jesus. But anyway, it's just you two together. Like no one can get in between you. No one's getting in between. And from that place, from that place, go do what he tells you to do. If there's anyone in this room that doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Saviour, and you're hearing what I've shared as the gospel, the truth, the story about Mary and Martha, a true story, by the way, then ultimately you need to know that Jesus is the way, he's the truth and he's the life. And he would say to you, come draw near to me. And the drawing near that you need to do right now is change your path. There's only two paths. There's one that's narrow and few go that way, but it leads to Jesus and it leads to Christ. It leads to eternal life. It's the best way. It's the only way. But there's another way that's wide and many people walk it. And every one of us in this room that is a Christian, we used to walk on that path. But it leads to destruction. It leads to death. And Jesus says, I need you to draw near to me. This is your first step. And your first step is to say, I no longer want to be on that path. I want to jump on the path that leads to Christ. I don't understand everything, but this is the path that I want to go on. And then from that moment, you'll start to understand what it means to draw near to Christ. And Christ will draw near to you, Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha will mean so much more to you then. But first of all, God would say to you, step from that path onto this path. There's a word called repentance. Repentance is saying, I'm sorry for the things that I've done wrong. That's the sin. I accept. I've made mistakes. I've done it wrong. I want to turn away from it. And I want to look to you now, Jesus. I'm starting this new road, this new path. If there's anyone in this room today that says, I don't know Jesus as Lord and Saviour, but today I choose to follow Jesus. I want to step from that road to the narrow road. While every head is bowed, every eye closed, would you just raise your hand for me? I just quickly want to pray for you. If there's anyone in this room at all that says, I don't know Jesus, but today I choose to follow him. I don't know.